Good morning. If you'll find a seat, we will have church. Let's start the service off by standing and singing Blessed Assurance. to Emmanuel Baptist Church on this second Sunday of August in 2024. And I tell you what, it couldn't be a more beautiful August morning out there, could it? Yeah. Uh, absolutely wonderful weather. We are very blessed and it is a rich and wonderful blessing to be here in service, in worship with each and every one of you today. For all of y'all out there watching the live stream, we welcome you as well. If you're watching this recording sometime from now, whenever, we welcome you with us also. And so getting to announcements, we are getting in, great news, back to school season, right? Uh, so much excitement fills the room from everybody. But before that, it is August, and we have a whole bunch of stuff going on at Emmanuel Baptist Church. First and foremost, tonight, Sunday, August the 11th, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., we have our Emmanuel Baptist Olympics come to the church. Now, you don't have to be an athlete to participate. So, okay, <laughs> good, thank you, Debbie. So we have that tonight from 6 to 9. There's going to be food, there's going to be Olympics. It should be, it sounds like a lot of fun. This week, Board of Shepherds have a meeting, Finance Committee has a meeting, and there is Bible studies working through the book of Ephesians on Wednesday. Also, on Sunday the 18th, we'll be honoring Pastor and his lovely family for five years coming up. And also... The week after that, two weeks from yesterday, Sunday, uh, Saturday, August Saturday, August 24th at Parchment Valley, gather 11, eat at 12. We're going to eat good, and we're going to spend some time at one of the true treasures of West Virginia Baptist Convention, Parchment Valley. So please come to that. That said, as we head into fall, we have a mission moment today.
Good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that everybody knows that in the pew in front of you, uh, you on the back of the pew in front of you, there are offering envelopes for Share the Light, one great hour of sharing. Uh, also, I want to draw uh, attention to the insert in the bulletin this morning. It is Sharing the Light in the Midst of War. This is about the Ukraine... Uh, the country of Ukraine and what they are experiencing at this time. We all know what, what we hear on the news, but we don't often hear about the groups that are helping the Ukrainians. And it just happens to be that the Baptist World Mission is, is one of the groups that does help the people in Ukraine and during this wartime. Uh, they have uh, started, even started new churches over there you know, in a time of war, when people are, are being hurt, being killed, when people are losing their homes and their loved ones and their businesses and their jobs, they are opening up new churches and sharing the word of God. They are sharing the light even within their own country. <laughs> Hurricanes and natural disasters bring out some of the best in people. Folks of every race, of every religion, or no religion at all, of every class, step forth to help those who are hurting, whose lives are in shambles, who may wonder if anyone cares about them at all. They need not wonder, for folks, excuse me, for folks with much with trucks and boats, have helped carry people to safety, have helped get de desperately sick people to hospitals, have tried to make sure that families stay together and have a safe place to recover. Know this, we too are, are those people. We may not drive a truck or pilot a boat, but we too can help our neighbors in dire need. While we may want to join our hands to those in the affected area of Ukraine or Florida or Texas or um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the islands that have experienced uh, hurricanes and tornadoes, we are helping them. We are ready to help when our presence is needed, but in the meantime, we can pray and we can give Every dollar given for disaster relief to one great hour of sharing, our wider church family's disaster relief ministry will go to work through our partners to assist those impacted by the terrible disasters. Long after the headlines have faded and the cameras have gone, been turned off, one great hour of sharing and its partners will still be there helping with long-term recovery. Please give generously, knowing that your gifts will help both now and in the months and years to come. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gifts that are given to one great hour of sharing that can be used not only throughout the world in other countries where there are disasters and where there is war and where there is strife, but also in our own country where we have experienced uh, weather disasters. Father, I just pray for um, the people who have experienced and who have received some of this love. Help us always to share our light. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Shirley. And also, Jim has an announcement today. It takes a lot of folks to keep Emmanuel Baptist Church running. Uh, almost all those positions are volunteers. They're, we have board members and ministry team men members and committee members, and they all are working behind the scenes to do various things. But we also have some people who, have, who are filling what used to be paid staff positions. And these people are volu voluntarily keeping, so to speak, those seats warm until the church is able to get paid staff back together again. 
One of those people is here just about every Sunday. We enjoy the talent and the music of Nancy Ball. Come. Nancy gets on my case every now and then. She will say, who in the world picked that song? <laughs> of course, it was me. Yep, it's true. But uh, we get through it. Nancy, thank you so much for everything you do. Uh, we appreciate it. Here is a love gift from the, the Sunday school classes, flowers from the congregation. And I believe the quilting ministry uh, has something for you as well. <laughs> we thank you so much for all you do. As Nancy says, she can't read music, so that's a, a remarkable talent to be able to play whatever I throw at her to, to play. Uh, I have one more announcement to make. Uh, immediately following the service this morning, I would like to meet with the Board of Servants over here on the front pew so we can finalize uh, for the luncheon next week. So don't forget servants to meet here right after the service. Thank you. Our call to worship today is Psalms 147, verses 7 through 11. Sing to Yahweh with thanksgiving. Sing praises to our God on the lyre. He is the one who covers the heavens with clouds, the one who provides rain for the earth, the one who makes grass to sprout on the mountains, who gives to the animal its food and to the young ravens which call out. He does not delight in the midst of the horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of man. Yahweh is pleased with those who fear him, those who wait for his loving kindness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are humbled today to be before you, to come before you in worship, to come before you praising in song, in music, and in the hearing of the word of God. We pray your blessings on our service today. We pray your spirit is working powerfully, moving in us, drawing us ever closer to Christ Jesus and the works that you have prepared for us. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen.
Let's continue worship this morning by standing and singing, I am thine, O Lord.
Please remain standing for the offertory prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. We come before you in gratitude for all that you've given us, how richly and wonderfully you've blessed each and every one of you. We pray you take our tithes, that you take our offerings and you use them, that you bring glory to yourself and you build your church, Father. And we are humble and thankful for our ability to participate. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. Thank you for your prayers this past week. Last weekend, my family and I were at a wedding in the northern part of Ohio with a family friends, both the bride and groom or family friends. Uh, it was a wonderful time. The couple met six and a half years ago at the youth group I was doing at the church I was serving then. And uh, it was wonderful then to have the privilege to be the officiant as they came together as husband and wife. And so we thank you for those prayers. Also, I want to say I was at Camp Global Friday and yesterday. Cindy, or not Cindy, but uh, Nardis and Hannah and I, I'm not awake yet, rolled in about 11.30, 12 o'clock last night. Uh, but uh, I encourage you, camp normally doesn't run quite that late. We had to let the girls help get things cleaned up to close up camp for the year. But um, if you get the chance next year, go to Camp Global. It was awesome. Heard about the Russian Mission Partnership and hopefully some things that might be opening up there, especially in light of all world events. Heard about the trip that went to Kenya this year, the trip that went to Mexico this year. We had Dan Chetty, uh, he and his wife serve the unreached people of the Middle East. He himself and many that he works with are literally lives on the line to be a Christian and to be sharing the gospel where the gospel is not welcome. And then also we had, uh, which were here uh, Wednesday night, Mike and Becky Mann from Northern Thailand and with their ministry. And one of the things that they do is they have helped people stop growing opioids and to grow coffee. And so just as a side note, if you would be interested, about Wednesday, Todd's going to bring some coffee by here. If you would like to have some, let the office know. They have all sorts of variety of Thai coffee. I did actually try it. I'm not a coffee drinker, but I have to say it was pretty good. And I don't like coffee, but I did give it a chance. And uh, they had one of the five or six things that they make, but they do that as a crop for those hill people of Thailand so that they have an option rather than growing drugs that end up here in the U.S. and other places in the world, to be growing coffee. And so uh, it's just a great time. And I am very proud of my girls, Norris and Hannah, who gave their summer at Cowan. And you have no idea how hard they work and the other ones that work with them. Uh, it was Debbie and Cindy know. But... Um, I'm not sure how many students went through Cal, and I was looking up, and this year many of the camps were in excess of 150 students, and then you add 50 to 70 adults that are there as counselors and support staff, and then you have the camp staff. I mean, it was just amazing, but do continue to pray for camping. The schedule will come out probably in about three or four weeks for next summer, and if we get it out, we will put it out, and I encourage you to prayerfully consider what God would have you be a part of what God is doing. It is exciting to see the word of God go forth, lives changed for eternity, and to see young people who are excited about their faith in Christ. So you get to be a small part of that. I encourage you to pray for the camping program, but also consider how you might be a part. Frank, thank you for a great message last week. I watched it between two and three while I was waiting at the cabin to go back over for the wedding in the afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. Wonderful word. Appreciate it. Today we're in Romans chapter 3, and so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. Uh, the screen's going to have verses 23 and 24, but I'm going to add 22, so if you'll want to stand with me, I'm going to read 22, 23, and 24, but you'll see 23 and 24 on the screen. And that is me, I changed that as I walked up here. So Roger had no chance to change what's in the slides. Verse 22 says, this righteousness is given through faith, through, uh, through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Now verse 23 and 4. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless the reading and our hearing of his word today. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of life, for the breath you've given us. Lord, for the mobility that allows us to be in this place. And Lord, being at camp this week and uh, this weekend and hearing about where many places in the world, what we're doing this morning cannot take place without threat of life. And so, Lord, we are so blessed and we thank you for the privilege we have to be able to come and to worship and to sing songs of praise to you, to look into your word. And Lord, help us to never, ever take that for granted. God, I pray that as we come this morning, 
that you would help us to set aside the anticipations of the day or the days yet to come. And Lord, to let alone the yesterdays of life, but for these precious moments, help our eyes and our hearts and our minds be fixed upon you, our Redeemer, our Savior, our King. And Lord, I ask that you take these simple words I prepared and allow them to be a means by which you would speak your truth to each of our hearts. Lord, may it move us. May we find that place, that point of application, that action point that you want us to engage. And may we do so this day, that you may receive all glory, all honor, and all praise. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us this time. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Paul writes this letter, just not to forget this, he's writing to a group of people he has not yet seen. He knows some of the people who've gone and worked there. He knows Aquila and Priscilla. He knows Apollo who've gone and worked in Rome, but Paul yet has to get there. And as he pens this letter, Paul's writing to them with a deep burden upon his heart that they will fully understand this faith they have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That they'll understand what it means to walk as a Christian. And so he lays out in this letter point after point after point after point, and we're going to look at a few of those today and in the weeks to come, that remind us what it really means, what it is to be a Christian to be a follower of Christ and how our lives are lived differently from the rest of the world. And that application really unfolds starting in verse 12, which will happen first part of October. But today we're in chapter 3. And as Paul has laid out that there is a gospel that we need to boldly proclaim, right? I am used to this weekend, people have just been reacting to all the speakers. We have been a gospel that we must share, right? right? The world needs to hear it. It is the source of life. And as he then said, and we looked at two weeks ago, there is no excuse. The world is without excuse. All humanity will be without excuse when they stand before God. But brothers and sisters, he has entrusted to you and to me this privilege this responsibility, this calling to take the gospel message forth. And when we come to this point in chapter 3 of his letter, this portion of his letter, Paul wants to understand that we are all sinners. If you think you are sinless, I'm sorry. You're wrong. No one has to sit down and teach us to sin. I did not sit my four kids down as they were growing up and say, okay, now this is what you do to be bad. Did any of you? No. It comes naturally, we say, right? It's because this human nature of ours is fallen, it's broken, it's defiled. When Adam ate the fruit in the garden from the knowledge of the good tree of good and ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let me get my words out in the right order. At that moment, in that instant, in that act of rebellion, we've all now bent away from God and into sin. It just comes. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to really ponder it too much. If we leave ourselves to ourselves, it will manifest itself in many in multiple ways. Every human being, save one, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, is under condemnation. Our sin demands that God send judgment. You realize that, right? If God is all loving, he must also be all just. If God is perfectly loving, he must be perfectly just. Because his justice would mean nothing, and his love would be empty if those two things were not true. God loves us. He loves us so much that he sees the condition we are in. 
He looks down from heaven and his heart breaks as we delve deeper and deeper and deeper into the sinfulness of this world. And his love sees that condition of humanity and he reaches down and redeems us. He reaches down and makes a way that we can be saved. And it is not exclusive to any particular group of people, but is open to all, correct? In John 3.16, it does not say, for God so loved the Jewish people. Or for God so loved the people who are good 90% of the time. What did he say? The world. Everyone. And so as we are all sinners... No one is above anyone else. Every one of us has fallen short of that perfection that God calls us to. We also find ourselves then facing God's judgment. It's wrath. It's what God must do to the sin that's entered his perfect creation. And because God knew that would happen, because God knows all things past, present, and future. He set in place a plan. He set a place in plan that he would save us from that cesspool of sin that we find ourselves in. We are caught in sin. It enslaves us. It chains us if we let it. If we do not turn to him, we will find ourselves enslaved to the evil and the sin that is all around us. We'll find ourselves sliding down a slippery slope that we cannot stop. It's like one time when I was a teenager and the youth group was out doing this hike. And I hit some loose rocks. And fortunately, I just slid on my behind about 50 feet down. And couldn't stop. And everyone else is yelling. And I'm just sliding. I eventually did come to a stop. And I'm thankful because it wasn't too much further until there was a really big drop. But I couldn't stop it. I was helpless to stop it. And there was nobody in the group who could do anything about it. I hit some loose gravel in the path that was narrow. And down I went. And away I slid. That's where we're at, folks. The sin that we find ourselves entangled in, that which grips hold of us and rips us away from God's perfect plan for our lives, it ripped Adam and Eve away when they rebelled. And it continues to rip and tear and, and to pull and, and, to, and to claw at us, to pull us down till we're in a place that we are helpless and we are hopeless. See, my sin demands... That I must die. You understand that, right? Don Byram's sin demands that Don Byram die. I really don't want that to happen. I don't want that. But I can't change it. And listen, your sin demands... That you also die. And the death we're talking is not just a cessation of this life, but it's an eternal dying that the scripture talks about. And friends, we are helpless in this place. We are helpless. There is no way we can change it. We will spend eternity paying the debt we owe. Nothing can change that that we can do. Therefore, we are helpless and we are also hopeless. Because, man, if that's all I've got to look forward to, this is a pretty dismal life. There's not much to smile about. There's not much to celebrate. There's definitely no joy. But see, that's the condition every person finds themselves in. Every person is facing that consequence for the sin in our lives. If we leave it to ourselves, we can live this life And we may live in the world's eyes a high point. But at the end, we will be bankrupt. Because we will lose all, including life itself. To spend eternity in hell. See, that's our condition. 
That's what Paul wants us to understand. And it doesn't matter, he says, if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Because he realizes there's still some Jews who think they're God's chosen people. And somehow they get a free pass. But see, Paul discovered that wasn't true. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. All of us are in a place where we are helplessly and hopelessly lost. And we are dying. And we can't turn it around. We can try all we want. But folks, it's coming. We might push the date a little bit, but the day will come. But see, God, as he looks down at that condition of humanity, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, before the foundations of the earth were laid, God, in his sovereignty and in his all authority and his omniscience, reached down. What would that look like? Jesus left the throne of heaven by the plan. And he took on human form so that he would be fully God, but also fully man. He alone would be sinless, born of the Virgin Mary. But God, Jesus, comes down The more I ponder that, I'm just amazed that he would come down to leave the throne of heaven, to leave the place where he is adored by all of creation in that supernatural spiritual realm. Not a tongue does not confess his glory. Not a tongue does not announce his goodness. Not a voice stops singing his praise. Read Revelation 4. It's beautiful. Jesus stepped down from that place and humbled himself so that he could put on human flesh. So that he could walk here among us. That was God reaching down to us. To you, to me, to all the world. See, that's the gospel we get to tell the world. We get to tell them that what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, is the result of sin's entrance into creation. But God has done something. He has come down. God the Son, Jesus Christ, by the Father's Spirit and Son's decision, came down. And he walked this earth for 33 years. And for three of those final years, he announced and proclaimed and said, God is doing a new thing. No longer would the laws be written upon stone tabs but upon the hearts of men. Therefore, as Paul says in Romans 1, we are all without excuse. We'll not be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know. Because we'll know to some point. And friends, they're needing to hear the truth of this salvation, of this cross work of Christ, that Jesus came and journeyed and walked among us just like the lamb lived among the family until time of sacrifice and was taken to the temple and slain and killed for the sin of that family. Jesus came and he died on the cross so our debt would be paid in full. I didn't do that. It wasn't my idea. I would never have thought of it. But God did. And see, that's the story we get to say. Christ's work on the cross pays the debt of sin in full so that we are saved. Jesus on that cross, literally, as Paul writes to the Corinthians, became sin for us. You realize that? All the sin in my life, and I sure don't want that public. And all the sin in your life that you don't want public. And all the sin of all the world of those who are living in this very breath. And of all those who have ever lived and all those who will live until the end of time. He took that sin upon himself and he became sin. So that when he was attached to the cross, the full debt of sin was paid by the sacrifice By one who died, the eternal, infinite God-man, perfect, died. So you and I could be saved. 
He paid that debt completely. There's nothing more to owe, folks. It's not about performance anymore. It's not about merit anymore. It's not about successes anymore. We always do that, right? We think our salvation is dependent upon us. Folks, it sure was not dependent upon me. It's dependent upon Jesus hanging on that cross and his willingness to go to the cross. To even the final night to say, Father, is there another way? But if not, I'll go. And he paid the debt in full for all the world. No one's left out. Every tongue and every nation and every people group, everyone. Yes, even that annoying neighbor next door. And that one in your life that you'd really not like to be around because they're just one of those people who need a little extra tender loving care. Yeah, for them too? He paid that debt in full. Because Jesus is our Savior. There is no other. There's a lot of people looking. A lot of people searching. A lot of people anticipating. And it ain't Jesus they're looking for. They're still waiting for science to come up with the miracle that lets us all live, what, forever. We're still searching for it. We're still waiting for the philosophy that comes out that's going to set our minds at ease so when all the stuff of this world happens, we can somehow go beyond. You've got those religions who say we would just keep cycling through. <laughs> one life after another. Maybe we'll get it right one time. <laughs> it's interesting. See, no, that's, that's not true. It's appointed a man once to die. Then we're in judgment. And it's at that moment it matters whether Jesus is your Savior. That's when it matters. Because he is our Savior. He's your Savior. He's my Savior. He's the Savior of the world. And friends, that's the story. That's the message. That's the declaration that God calls you and me and all who call upon Him and follow Him to declare to the world that at this place, the cross on Golgotha, He paid it in full and offers it as a gift. We were drowning, friends. And maybe today you're still drowning. Because if you've not let Jesus have control of your life, to sit on the throne of your life, to confess your sin and put full faith in him, not Jesus and something else, friends, that's not Christianity. It's not, well, I believe in Jesus, but i got to be good. Because, man, I don't want to die on a bad day because I might not make it. See, we're not trusting in Jesus. That's a performance-based Where I've accomplished all this stuff, surely God will let me into this heaven. There's only one question at the gate. What have you done with Jesus? It's only a question. We're drowning. We might be going under for near the last time. But it's this Jesus who dives in. And I don't use the river, I'm going to say cesspool. <laughs> Not where I want to be, but he goes, dives right in there to reach down. And to pick us up. To save us. To be our lifesaver. But just like one who works at a pool, guarding so that someone doesn't drown, they can only save those who give up. You realize that, don't you? See, if you're still fighting... If you're still kicking, if you're still demanding that somehow you're going to pay that debt, that you're going to do this, you're going to fix it all. Listen, your Savior's right there. Your lifeguard's right there. He's right there. He's right there with you. He's right there beside you. He's trying to invite you to just give up and let Him so that He can be your Savior. Because Paul lays out here, all have sinned, but it's only through the righteousness of Christ's work on the cross that any is saved. But through that, all who come are saved. So the question is, Jesus saves. 
He saves. He saves. Can't say it enough. He saves. Has he saved you? And that's between you and God. It does not matter what the exterior looks like, friends. Because we can, as humans, put a pretty good false front up. We can make it look good. But we know what's really there. And right now, your Savior wants to bring you to life. He wants to take and set you on solid ground. And what's so wonderful is when He does... <laughs> when he does he starts cleaning us off and all the stuff we tried to hide from him and hide from the world he just takes away there's no more hiding we can live transparently and authentically and we let the world see that we are truly now someone new And Paul will talk more about that later in the letter and we'll talk about it but this morning are you saved? Because the song we're going to sing reminds us, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And if you have not made that decision, hear me. My prayer is you'll make it right now. You'll come. Because you're never going to find another way. <laughs> How many years have we been here? Thousands? We haven't figured it out yet. It's one way. Jesus stated it, John 14, I am the way. <laughs> Another one. But see, it means I have to surrender. It means I have to give up. It means I have to stop striving and fighting and planning and controlling. I have to give up. And the moment I do, it's Jesus who grabs hold and brings us to life. This morning, if you have not made that decision, God knows and you know. Paul says in the second Chronicle, Second Corinthians chapter 4, today's the day. Today's the day. And brothers and sisters, we don't lose our salvation, but I tell you, we can sometimes really get entangled with this old world because we aren't following with our eyes on Jesus. We start looking somewhere else, and the next thing you know, we're feeling overwhelmed all over again. He doesn't want us to live there. This invitation is a time to say, Lord, I've kind of gotten out of step. I messed up. I'm going the wrong path. Lord, I've kind of turned my back. You know, he never turned his back on you. You might have turned it on him. But he says, come, set it right. Let me put you on the right path. Let me clean off the dirt and the mud. What did he say to Peter? Peter, I don't need to wash. I just need to wash your feet. For he who's been cleansed just needs feet washed. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe God's saying I want you to take a step beyond just receiving me, but be engaged in, in the ministry and the life of church. Because see, we're the witness. We're the presence of God. If he's calling you to that, I invite you to come. Whatever God may be calling you to do, there'll be people up here. Sir, shepherds will come. If all of us get busy, servants will come. We want to pray with you. Because we want you to leave the place today saved by our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Paul's clear words. It doesn't matter who we are. We have all sinned and fall short but you have justified us and you've done it freely by grace through Christ's work on the cross Lord this morning my prayer is that every person here is in that right place and I've just been talking to the choir church term <laughs> talking to this already there but Lord I don't want to make any assumptions Lord I pray that if those that are here or those that are watching, there's among us one who needs to make that choice. Today we'll quit striving. We'll quit wrangling. We'll quit trying to figure out. And we'll just rest in your arms and let you save us. 
And Lord, if we let the world pull us off path, bring us back. Lord, if it's time to engage and take a step to do so today. This is your time of invitation, God. We didn't create this minute, you did. And in it, you invite us. May we hear your voice. May we respond as you will, as we give up and accept your will for our lives. Bless this time of invitation. Speak to our hearts, I pray, in the name of our Redeemer, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing together. We have heard the joyful sound Jesus saved Tidings all around Jesus saves, Jesus saves Bear the news to every land Climb the steeps and cross the waves Onward to our Lord's command Jesus saves, Jesus saves Wafted on the rolling tide Jesus saves song of 
Alicia isn't a stranger to many of us. She's joined us Sundays and Wednesday nights for Bible study. Alicia has come this morning that she would like to be a part of our church family. And so following the benediction, I invite you to come up and greet her and welcome her. And uh, we will get information and move forward with the steps for her to be a member of our church. God bless you. Just stay right here with me. Good, good. Jesus saves. We get to tell somebody today, and tomorrow, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, be watching, be looking. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you have redeemed us and saved us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us our families and our church family. Thank you, Lord, for those friendships and those acquaintances that you bring into our lives where we can tell that wonderful story to announce the good news, the gospel, that you save us. And Lord, as we cross paths with those who need that message, may we have the courage to speak. May we share. May our eyes be open to see. And Lord, may you work and bring about your will that they too might know you. Give us a blessing this week so that we may be a blessing to others. I ask in Jesus' name. God bless you.